The idea that when you meet the love of your life and you want to commit in the sight of God in your community till death do you part, that your church says, no, you can't do that here. That, as a pastor, that breaks my heart. Love is in incredibly short supply in our world these days. The church ought to be celebrating love. Same-sex marriage is the law of the land. Since 2015, when the Supreme Court struck down same-sex marriage bans, millions of gay couples have married in America. But it doesn't mean the doors of all houses of worship are open and welcoming to gay, lesbian, and transgender couples to marry in their sanctuaries. Many mainline Christian churches still deny same-sex couples the right to marry in their chosen houses of worship. Everybody assumed when the Supreme Court ruled that same-sex marriage was legal, that all lesbian and gay couples could go out and marry the person they were in love with. Lots of churches have lots of different uh, rules around whether they will officiate uh, same-sex marriages. Reverend Naomi Washington Leapart is Faith Work Director for the National LGBTQ Task Force. She says the right to marriage rights in the church varies by geography, denomination, and individual church. The United Church of Christ and the Presbyterian Church USA and the Episcopal Church are all emphatically affirming of same-sex marriage, same-sex relationships from a national perspective, denomination-wide. However, clergy still have lots of power and lay people still have lots of power to really determine the atmosphere in their congregations. That atmosphere can and does result in individual churches that are not affirming. Reverend Leapart and her wife are members of a California United Church of Christ, or UCC, congregation. But they live in Pennsylvania and were worried about discrimination as they prepared for their wedding. They decided to forego a church wedding. We just flew in all of the <laughs> religious leaders that we wanted to participate, and we had the service on a beach. So I think it was a very holy experience. It was certainly religious in terms of its tone, its content, but it wasn't in a four-wall church. We didn't want to have to go through the disappointments of approaching a congregation, and then, oh, they find out it's two women, and then they say no. Uh, we had enough of that in the wedding pr planning process. Really? You had it in the wedding planning process? We said, we're getting married. Would you be our planner? And the person took a minute to respond um, and then said, I'm sorry, I won't be able to work with you. I believe in the biblical definition of marriage. Despite discrimination LGBTQ people face in certain churches, many stay affiliated. Sarah McBride of the Human Rights Campaign says it's for a variety of reasons. They may have grown up in that church. Their friends and their family members are part of that church. And they were a member of that church even before they began to grapple with their own gender identity or sexual orientation. McBride is optimistic that attitudes are changing for the better. A 2017 Pew Research Center study backs her up. It found 68% of white mainline Protestants support allowing gays and lesbians to marry legally, up from 43% in 2007. More and more we're seeing faith communities live up to the principles of their faith of love and inclusion and welcoming spaces. Sanctuary. A member of the task force on the study of marriage and... It was against this backdrop that Episcopalians recently gathered for the 79th Triennial General Convention. How do we live together when we are a truly and profoundly diverse community of faith? And if you look at the New Testament... Presiding Bishop Michael Curry, who may look familiar because he officiated at the wedding of Prince Harry and Meghan Markle, says it's a delicate balancing act as bishops, clergy, and laity continue to address church policy on same-sex marriage. The sacramental rite of holy matrimony at our last convention, this was in 2015 actually, um, we made that possible. It was opening up marriage so that people of the same sex could participate and take the same vows, be held to the same commitments that all people who are married in the church are 
we're accountable for. But how do you do that also at the same way, uh, at the same time, for people who disagree with that? We pause to celebrate the incremental victories that have been won on the road to that audacious goal of being a beloved community where there are no strangers at the gate. Reverend Susan Russell of All Saints Church in the Diocese of Los Angeles served on the task force on the study of marriage. The task force was set up to resolve conflicts after the 2015 Episcopal General Convention. As a priest and pastor, and as a lesbian, and as a feminist, I'm interested in how the church can continue to grow and address uh, the voices of the marginalized, uh, particularly women and LGBTQ people. In the process of doing this work, I myself got engaged and got married. At my ripe old age, God blessed me with a life partner who is an awesome wife and wonderful person. And so now bringing also the personal into the pastoral. Since the last general convention, trial marriage rights have been available for same-sex couples. The new liturgies had been used under the discretion and with the permission of the diocesan bishop. And clergy retained the canonical right to refuse to officiate at any wedding. Here at the historic St. John's Episcopal Church, across from the White House, where all of the presidents since Madison have come to worship, many same-sex weddings have been performed. Bishops of 93 of the 101 U.S. Episcopal dioceses gave their permission. Priests in the other eight dioceses were not allowed to perform same-sex weddings in or outside their churches or offer anniversary blessings to same-sex couples married in other dioceses. There are eight dioceses where the bishop has said no, that he, or in this case it would be he, they're all men, he will not authorize uh, use of those liturgies. And so one of the things we're trying to achieve here is to end what is kind of a de facto uh, sacramental apartheid, where for some Episcopalians in some dioceses, they don't have access to the sacraments because they're in a same-sex couple. The Bishop of Dallas created a provision called the I-30 Plan. She allows people who are gay or lesbian to come from Dallas to our church in Fort Worth via I-30. I have done at least three weddings for couples from the Diocese of Dallas. They are grateful to be able to have uh, their marriage blessed and performed in a sacrament of marriage uh, nearby. I rise to speak in favor of the goal of A085 in hopes that the many... Dallas pastor Casey Shobe says since the 2015 General Convention, they've had dozens of couples marry elsewhere and others are waiting and hoping they will soon be able to tie the knot in their own church. It's just such a source of great pain for members of a church who may have been members for decades to be told you can't be married in your own church by clergy who are your pastors, um, who have walked with you through important and sacred and sometimes painful moments of your life that suddenly for this particular ask, a, aspect of your life, you have to go somewhere else. Following hearings and deliberations across the country, the task force on the study of marriage arrived with proposed legislation to debate and vote on at the general convention. Members proposed eliminating the bishop's veto, allowing any church to use the trial marriage rights and changing the Book of Common Prayer to include the liturgy. They said, as Matthew 537 states, let our yes be yes. When the General Convention in 2015 approved same-sex marriage, we as a family celebrated because it provided hope for our son and his colleagues. Yet the Dallas Diocese prohibits same-sex marriage. We have seen the harm and hurtfulness of this action. If a child is baptized, why can't that same child of God receive all of the sacraments? By theologically redefining the sacrament of marriage, it seems that this resolution fails to take seriously both the scriptures and the majority of Christian tradition we are revising the ancient teachings of the church. Now, in 2003, when Gene Robinson was ordained, it wasn't all heaven that broke loose. <laughs> it was tough times. Gene Robinson was the first openly gay bishop in the U.S. Episcopal Church. 
the marriage rights need to be printed by order of this convention in the book of occasional services and therefore available to all clergy. I'd like to read this statement from my senior warden at St. Augustine's. Brad Jordan Hilden, a rector from a small South Dallas church, was a dissenting voice on the task force. Father Hilden worries that the process left out more traditional conservative churches, including Latin American parishes. I am a theological conservative. My understanding of scripture on this matter is that in Genesis, uh, God says that he has created us male and female in his image. We are blessed in order to be fruitful and multiply, to pass along the gift of life from generation to generation. We're talking about being a community where traditionalist folk, progressive folk, learn to live in love and charity with each other and there is equality of, of religious experience and spiritual access for all. You know, we can do one thing about marriage, but then you've got to figure out how do we live it out? And that's what we're working on now. The Episcopal Church has arguably been on the leading edge of um, full inclusion for LGBTQ people for a very long time. I mean, way back in 1976, we passed a resolution that promised full and equal claim on the pastoral care, concern, and love of the church for what we were then calling homosexual persons. Um, some of us say we've been spending 42 years trying to make that resolution a reality. We have word from our ecumenical partners that many of them are watching us to see how we do this, how can we stay together, how do we model unity and diversity, and we're hopeful that what we'll do out of this convention is send a message that it's possible to hold those diverse pieces together and come out one church. What will that message be? The Episcopal Church is led by two deliberative bodies, the House of Deputies and the House of Bishops. They'll make the decision the vote later, but first, what about other denominations that are watching? The United Methodist Church, with just shy of 7.2 million members, has been deeply divided over LGBTQ inclusion and same-sex marriage. The Western Jurisdiction in July of 2016 on the 17th ballot elected me. What made it unusual was I am the first openly gay bishop within the United Methodist Church, and that has caused a lot of disagreements, and yet also it's provided a lot of healing and hope for people who have waited a long time for this moment. In a 6-3 to three decision, the United Methodist Judicial Council ruled that the Western jurisdiction violated church law when it elected a lesbian as the bishop of UMC's Mountain Sky area. The court, however, did not remove her from her position. Bishop Karen Olavito presides over 400 churches in Colorado and other Rocky Mountain states. We support the legal rights of same-gender couples, but we will not marry them. We see marriage as a, 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 a right, R-I-T-E, between a man and a woman. We support LGBTQ people serving openly in the military. However, we have a don't ask, don't tell policy within the United Methodist Church. We support all families the shapes, but we still think that the family unit should be mother, father, and children. And so the, it's, it's this tension where, where the church is not of one mind. Bishop Olavito is open about officiating at same-sex marriages. When I first interviewed her in 2015, she was the senior pastor at Glide Church in San Francisco. I performed the very first same-gender legal wedding in a United Methodist Church in 2004 during San Francisco's Winter of Love. And I got a call from Michael, and Michael said, Karen, you're not going to believe this. He's one of my parishioners. They're marrying gay and lesbian people in City Hall in San Francisco. So when I got to City Hall, it was a giant love fest. If we believe God is love, God was busting out all over. And to be able to participate in their marriage, their legal marriage, was so profound. And, and yeah, I've done lots of weddings over the course of my ministry. It's only in gay and lesbian households that I see marriage licenses framed and put on the wall because it is seen as such a precious, precious symbol and a precious civil right that they are not taking lightly. Bishop Olavito is married. After many years of commitment, 
In 2014, she and Robin Reidenauer wed. Robin was quite sick, and we realized we had no legal protection for our relationship. And so we were married in a ceremony in, civil, in City Hall in San Francisco, but then had a religious ceremony with a hundred of our family members and friends. That was uh, one of the most important days of our life, to be able to say, this is who I'm committing myself to. This is the person who makes my soul sing. And uh, it's a day I will never forget. She cites scripture when noting the irony in the church not sanctioning same-sex marriages. One of the most used passages about love in weddings, whither thou goest, I shall go, your people shall be my people. That was said between two women. And yet we raise that up in heterosexual marriage. This is a model of covenant, of, of committing oneself. And yet we don't see the, the, the cognitive dissonance we create when we're using this relationship between two women to talk about the covenant of marriage, but then saying to two women, you can't have this relationship. In 2016, the General Conference appointed the Commission on the Way Forward. It's a 32-person body from different geographic locations, different theological orientations, and different sexual orientations. Its mission is to examine the Methodist Book of Discipline and suggest revisions where human sexuality is mentioned. We're recommending a one-church model, which removes all the anti-LGBTQ language, but enables each region, each pastor, each church to live out their conscience in response to ministry to LGBTQ people, in response to creating standards for ministry that may or may not include LGBTQ people. Delegates to a special session of the General Convention in 2019 will vote on the Commission's proposal. There are reports the compromise may not satisfy either side. The African Methodist Episcopal Church has more than 5 million members. It grew out of a protest against racial discrimination at white Methodist congregations in the late 1700s. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear... It's this history that keeps Reverend Jennifer Leith, a gay woman, in the church despite the church's condemnation of same-sex relationships. Those like Rosa Parks, who is an AME sister, those like the young folks who were part of the Brown versus Board of Education case. I'm one of those people who believes that there's something valuable about the institution and about building it up because we need one another and we need forms of connection with one another uh, that make, uh, that make um, communal social action possible. And so I stick with the church. I stick with the AME Church because it has this legacy of doing justice. The work that we've been doing as we have been reading sacred texts and allowing... Reverend Leith teaches about about the intersection of religion, sexuality, and social justice at the Iliff School of Theology in Denver. God anoints my head with oil. My cup runs over. Surely goodness and mercy shall fall. Dr. Leith is also the pastor at Campbell Chapel AME Church. With respect to same-sex marriage, the church believes that unions between people of the same sex are contrary to the will of God and also holds that those who are ordained or licensed to preach who participate in in same-sex unions or marriages um, are doing so in a way that is against the law of the church and, uh, and against the law of God. And the consequences for such participation include trial and the loss of one's orders. Reverend Leaf has been approached by a same-sex couple who wanted to get married. That was a scary moment. It was a scary moment to have this couple come and ask about, about getting married. <laughs> and ask about ways that I might be a part of honoring and affirming that marriage. It's frightening because I understand the law of the church and the church of which I'm a part. And I also believe that the law is wrong. So professional, personal uh, concerns made it difficult. Reverend Leith disputes the theory that affirming LGBTQ people would lead to a loss of members. 
the question though of, of, of leaving the church is complicated uh, because uh, people leave either way. <laughs> I've had um, more people in this particular charge come to me um, with concern because of my affirmation <laughs> than concern that I have not been affirming enough. In my previous charge, it was the other way around. <laughs> On the whole, many mainline Protestant traditions are experiencing loss of attendance in general. Um, and so one of the things I try to talk to pastors about is not scapegoating LGBTQ people as the reason their churches are experiencing attendance shrinkage. Losing members and churches has been used as a reason for not becoming affirming in the Methodist and the Episcopal churches. So it remains a concern for some back at the Episcopalian General Convention as bishops and deputies debated marriage equality. And I believe in the word of God where Jesus says love everyone and love your neighbor as yourself. So as love everyone, then let us all be married. <laughs> to foster consensus, a compromise resolution, B012, moved ahead. It dropped the provision to add the same-sex marriage liturgies to the Book of Common Prayer. The compromise allows priests to conduct same-gender marriages even if the local bishop disapproves. The local bishop would invite another bishop to provide pastoral support so congregants can marry in their own churches. We think that it makes space for uh, everybody in our church, and, and, and I at least hope that that's the path the General Convention takes. This resolution is the result of a careful process of broad consultation. This is one of those rare opportunities where I am finding myself in disagreement with my fellow communion partner bishops. And there are many in this church who have proclaimed that it is, and that it, this is a new thing that the Holy Spirit is revealing, and that the Episcopal Church is being prophetic in, in putting this forward. I don't believe presiding bishop that, that uh, that's necessarily true. I rise in support of B012 because it moves us another step away from the situation of separate but equal to which we have often consigned our LGBTQ sisters and brothers. I am deeply aware that as we stand here, we are being streamed from places like Tennessee and Dallas and Florida where the faithful in the pews are waiting for us to let our yes be yes, to say we do to marriage for all. Are you prepared to vote? All in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Those opposed, no. So ordered. The House of Deputies has voted to concur with the House of Bishops on Resolution B012 as amended. In the end, the compromise resolution passed. At least four bishops from the original eight disapproving dioceses ultimately approved the compromise. We've given up a lot. Um, there is real compromise in here, and there is pain for uh, gay and lesbian people, for LGBTQ people, for same-sex couples, that at this point, marriage in the prayer book will still be defined as between a man and a woman. A compromise that reaches out to those who are currently disenfranchised from the sacrament is worth the cost of waiting a little longer uh, to get the language fixed in the prayer book. Resolution B-012 goes into effect December 2nd, the first day of Advent. I think any change is hard. Any time when you're dismantling oppressive and patriarchal systems, it takes time. It takes perseverance. Uh, it takes, uh, nevertheless, she persisted kind of energy. Um, I would draw an analogy in our Episcopal Church, the ordination of women. And while mainline churches take up the issue of LGBTQ rights, advocates are sincerely concerned that a Supreme Court that is more and more conservative may strip away those rights. This is the moment for the church to say there's another way to live. There's a way to live so that each person's dignity is protected. There's a way to live so that love is the greatest thing we can offer one another. There's a way to live that says that each person is so vital here that their suffering is gonna move us 
to acts of justice and compassion. 